What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, the gospel uh, comes from uh, really a, uh, a term in the Greek language that refers to the good news of the message of Jesus Christ. Really, the gospel is a message. It is a, it is a word given from God revealed in the Bible, in the pages of Scripture, that tells man how we can be reconciled to a holy God. But actually, there's a similar statement as well, and it's like this. How can a holy God be reconciled to sinful man? That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. How can man be reconciled to God, and how can God be reconciled to man? That is the question that the gospel answers. The Bible reveals, first of all, that God is a holy God. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6 that God is holy, holy, holy. And what that means is God is entirely separate from anything and everything else uh, by his own nature. The fact that he is God. He and he alone is God, Isaiah 45 says. He and he alone is God. We find in the scriptures that God is righteous. We find that God is just. We find that God is a patient God, a loving God, a merciful God, a compassionate God. He is a God who forgives sin. Uh, and we find this, this character description of who God is, and you cannot overlook one to emphasize another. All of God is revealed in the fullness in the Word of God, and we have to take God for who He is and what He reveals Himself to be as disclosed in the Word of God. God is a holy, holy, perfect God. Habakkuk, the prophet, says that God uh, has nothing impure that can come before his eyes. He is entirely pure in every sense. But yet there is a, a, a huge, huge, overwhelming uh, calamity. And that is that we as human beings are sinners. In fact, as early as the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, says that all of the thoughts of all of man's intentions of his heart were only evil continually. And we find in the book of Psalms and scattered through uh, the, the early books of the Bible and all even into the New Testament, quoting the Old Testament scriptures, that there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who does good, none who seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. We, as human beings, by the very nature of being human, are corrupt. We, we are not just uh, sinners because we sin. We sin because we are, by nature, sinners. The very moment a person is conceived in the womb of his mother, he is at that point a sinner because he is of the line of Adam. He is in the, the posterity of Adam. When Adam sinned, our first parent, every human being who has ever been born in the history of the world, born of a natural birth, has been conceived and birthed and lived a life of sin. That, that these are the two complete extremes that the Bible paints for us. That God, on the one hand, is entirely pure and perfect and holy and sovereign, and yet on the other end of the spectrum, mankind is completely corrupt, completely defiled, vile and wicked and heinous, God-hating. In fact, Romans 8 and, and verse 7 says that, that no one who is living in the flesh can please God at all. John 3 says, because non-believers live in the darkness and they hate the light. So how could man be reconciled to God? Man certainly can't do anything to come to God because he hates God. He has no regard for God. He, he wouldn't want anything to do with God. He, he loves his sin. He is born in sin. He loves his transgression. He loves his immorality so much that he could not, he would not, and he dare not ever come to God in his own supposed free will. So how can man be reconciled to God? 
what has to happen in order for man to have a right relationship with God or for God to have a saving relationship with sinful man. You see, something that is quite amazing in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, says that if someone were to justify a wicked man, it would be an abomination. God cannot overlook sin. He can't because he's a just judge. He's a righteous God. By his very nature, he has to punish sin. It's not a matter of God overlooking sin. It's not a matter of God ignoring sin. He can't. He can't. So how is God going to acquit you? How is God going to look at you and find you not only as innocent, but you got to be righteous. You got to be pure. You got to be like God. You got to be holy in every respect. You have to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. You have to obey all of God's law. After all, the the scripture says, the one who abides by all of the laws and yet breaks only one is guilty of breaking all of them. Guilty of breaking them all. So every person on the planet then is guilty of breaking all of God's divine laws. And that's what sin is. Sin is lawlessness, the book of 1 John says. So you can't do anything to come to God. You can't live a good enough life whereby you, by your own strength, by your own religiosity, by your own effort, in your own religion, by your own morality, by your own sacrifices, you cannot come to God. You can't. It's not a matter of the will. It's a matter of ability. You can't. You can't. The Bible says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. You see, here's the beautiful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the Bible. Here is where the gospel of Jesus Christ and biblical Christianity diametrically opposes itself from every other man-made religion in the world. Every other religion teaches the way you come to God is by your strength. You have some part to play in your effort, in your deed, in your religion, in your ceremony, but not the Bible. The Bible says you can't do anything, so God had to solve the problem by doing everything. And he did. God took the initiative even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, living in the lusts of the world, enslaved to the sins in which we lived, having no regard for God, no love for Christ, no worship of the triune God. We had no regard for God whatsoever. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 and verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, he made us alive together in Christ. That's what God did. God made us alive. You can't make yourself alive. The Bible doesn't say we made ourselves alive. The Bible doesn't say I made myself alive. The Bible doesn't say the church made me alive. My baptism made me alive. Communion made me alive. The Pope made me alive. My good efforts made me alive. It doesn't say that. Ephesians says, He made us alive. God made us alive together with Christ. You see, salvation is an act of one. Salvation is the doing of one. Theologians have called this a monergistic salvation. That is to say, it is the work of one, the the work of God and God alone. Salvation is entirely God's work. That's why Jonah could pray in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9 and say, Salvation is from the Lord. David prayed the same thing in Psalm 3. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Paul said in Romans chapter 3 and verse 27, Where is boasting? Where is boasting if if I can't bring myself to God, but God had to save me? Where is boasting? And it is excluded. You cannot boast. There is no room for boasting. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, the Bible says. Jeremiah speaks of that. So how can God, 
How can God be just in punishing sin, but yet how can God be a justifier in providing salvation to sinners? There's only one way God could do this. One way. He had to pour out his wrath. He had to rightly punish sin. God solved it by sending his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man, the one who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God sent Jesus born of a virgin, so that he wouldn't be defiled by Adam's sinful nature. Born of a virgin. Jesus lived a perfect life. The Bible says, in him there is no sin. And he obeyed the Father's will in everything. He was resolute to follow the Father's will, to do what the Father had, had given him to do, to accomplish the Father's plan. And what Jesus did, 30 years of life, never sinned, never lied. Tempted? Yes. Fallen into that temptation, into sin? No. Entirely perfect. He was a full man, a real man, a human being, lived a life just like you and me. But yet he was a perfect man, unlike you and me, because he was God. 100% God. And, and in a supernatural, amazingly mysterious way, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, lived a perfectly pure life. And here's what happened. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53 that God crushed Jesus the Son on the cross. He bore the iniquities of us all. He became a sin offering. He made atonement on the cross. He became our redemption on the cross. He came to save us on the cross. Jesus procured the salvation for those whom the Father had given to him. Jesus died for his people. And when he died, the Bible says, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, what happened on the cross is what we could call the great exchange. God treated Jesus, his son, as if he lived my sinful life. And God poured out his just judgment, his righteous punishment, his eternal wrath, his flaming fury and divine vengeance that I deserve forever in hell. God poured all that out upon Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. God was just in punishing sin. He was just. And when a sinner finds that message of salvation in Jesus Christ and hears about the glorious work at the cross that Jesus Christ in his love accomplished and achieved and procured and perfected and the sinner looks to the cross and looks to Jesus Christ and believes on him and him alone for salvation, the Bible says he is saved. The Bible says he is saved. Whoever would call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, Joel says. And Romans quotes that in chapter 10. The Bible says we are saved not by our works, but we are saved by faith. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. It is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. If you're saved, it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you. You need to be right with God. But yet the only way that you can be right with God is for God to make you right with himself. And he does it by grace. In the work of Christ. The redemption at the cross. 
when the Spirit of God regenerates you and gives you life, and you look to Jesus Christ in faith. And meanwhile, repentance is a necessary element of the gospel as well. Repentance is a biblical term that means to turn. It means to, 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 to change your mind, to change your will, to change your affections, to change your life, to change your behavior. It's really an all-encompassing term. It means to turn and stop living the way you're living and begin living a new way. Repentance and faith. Paul preached in Acts 17, he said, God is commanding all men everywhere to repent. That means to turn. Because God has fixed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness through the man whom he has appointed, and that is Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith in Christ? It's not a decision. It's not asking Jesus into your heart. It's not going to church and having a feeling. It's not singing a worship song and having an emotional, warm, fuzzy feeling in your stomach. It's, it's not being excited for God after a, a conference or a retreat or a sermon or something you've heard or, or, or a crusade. It's not that. Here's what genuine salvation, genuine conversion is. It is a life of following Christ. In fact, Jesus said you've got to count the cost. You need to count the cost. Because if you're going to follow Jesus, there will be hardship. All who desire to live godly will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3 says. If the world hated me, Jesus said in John 15, they will hate you also. If anyone lives as a friend of the world, he has made himself an enemy of God, James chapter 4 verse 4 says. Do not love the world, the things of the world. For the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life is evil. And if a man lives that way, the love of the Father is not in him, First John chapter 2 says. So if someone will live a life, will live a life pursuing God, then he will follow God. He will live for God. He will obey God. He will serve God. He will abide in Christ. He will abide in the word of God. He will join himself to a local church. He will have a passion for the lost and share the gospel with them. He will live wholeheartedly, persevering in his faith, enduring through hardship, growing through trials. Will he struggle with sin? Sure. But he will grow in his faith. That's a Christian. That's a Christian. But yet you need to be warned. Jesus said in Luke, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Unless you repent, unless you turn, you will likewise perish. Unless you come to Jesus Christ and him alone in saving faith and you cling to his work at Calvary and what he did in the place of sinners, if you don't do that, then the Bible says in John chapter 3, in verse 36, the wrath of God is abiding upon you. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unbelief. The wrath of God is like a sword that is hanging over your neck if you're not saved. And it's merely a matter of God's sovereign prerogative when he chooses to let the sword down and destroy you forever in the lake of fire. Turn, repent, believe, leave your life, abandon yourself, deny yourself, follow Christ. Put your hand to the plow and don't look back. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of salvation whereby a wicked sinner, a stench in God's nostrils, by God's initiative and by God's grace, can be brought into God's family, adopted as a beloved, cherished, treasured, gloriously bestowed, richly blessed child of God with an eternity of glory, with a wealth of eternal blessing awaiting him in heaven where he will worship Christ and see him face to face 
and bow before his throne forever and ever, saying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive wisdom and power and riches and might forever and ever. Amen.